Continuing our reading in No Frills Science Fiction. Today is Chapter 7. After you pushed us ahead, Dana was explaining, we just kept running. The bot was just turning back for you when the professor had a little accident, didn't you, Prof? Mutely, Carberry pointed to a rising welt on his forehead. Ran straight into it, Dana continued, and here we are. Now, all we have to do is get inside, Alex said. And fast, he added with a look back over his shoulder. The roaring seemed to have subdued for the present, but he knew that he'd never forget his glimpse of cold alien insect intelligence. The memory made him shiver. When he recovered, he saw that his companions were chuckling softly. What's so funny? he demanded irritably. Alex doesn't seem to understand, Carberry commented to no one in particular. Poppy explained, Don't you see, Alex, we are inside, inside a zoo. When he looked more carefully at the wall towering overhead, Alex saw that it was quite true. They were inside a huge hemispherical cage. What he had thought was the sky was part of the wall. I imagine that all this was meant to keep those brutes back there safely locked up, he remarked. Incredible that this should be preserved all these thousands of years, but where is the door? Poppy quickly supplied the answer by rising several hundred feet and surveying the perimeter. An open portal could be found only a half mile away. By skirting the edge of the grass and keeping their backs to the wall, they found it. Unfortunately, so had the ants. The area around the portal was littered by their refuse. The door led not to an outside, but to a dark and seemingly endless network of corridors. At the entrance to the subterranean world, the four paused to consider their next move. Through the portal, darkened corridors echoed with the steady drip of water. Above the echoes could be heard the faint chirrup of the ant creatures, but from which direction it was impossible to tell. When Alex stepped into the corridor, he turned to trace his way up toward the surface of the planet. No one argued this time. None of them wanted to go deeper. Alex led, his way lit from behind by the useful robot. Carberry and Dana clambered after him. Their strenuous escape had drained the old professor, and he leaned heavily on Dana's arm. For her part, Dana was desperately trying to conceal her fear and disgust of the ant creatures. They were evidently in some sort of zoological wing of the huge library planet. They passed vast chambers filled with hot sand and burning suns, supporting languid reptiles. A jungle habitat held a creature that was disturbingly man-like in appearance, but when Dana tried to coax it closer, it screeched and ran off on all fours. When they opened one door, Alex nearly fell into a pool of dark, viscous liquid. A full mile across the huge space, a small, arid island dotted the interior sea. Still, another chamber was dark, fetid, and damp. Either the life support system had failed, or whatever was supposed to make its home here preferred mold and filth to green grass and clean waters. In all their search, they found not one other chamber open to the corridors. This puzzled Alex and worried him. Had the portal to the ant chambers been left open by accident, or had it been opened by the creatures themselves? Meanwhile, hints of echoes suggested that the group was being followed. Alex resolved to get to the surface as quickly as possible. We haven't a chance of finding this map thing, Dana was complaining. We could search for centuries and never even leave this section of the planet. Carberry agreed. Very unscientific approach, if I do say so. What we need to do is locate the equivalent of a card catalog. No other way through all this. They were right, Alex thought. But for the moment, his primary concern was keeping them alive. The noises were getting louder. In a subdued manner, Poppy was signaling his attention. Don't vocalize. The bot was saying, I don't think the others should hear this. The ant creatures are no more than 10 or 15 minutes away. 
I can't read their minds, but I can detect their presence. Any suggestions? I don't think we're too far from the surface. I suggest we make a run for it. Too late to do anything else. Alex was broadcasting back when he caught a whiff of the dreaded formic scent. Breaking into speech, he shouted, Run! And the three humans, with Poppy bringing up the rear, scattered down the corridor in a blind, headlong panic. In the distance, echoing obscenely in the closed halls, the ants' chitinous chirrup mounted again into the shrill scream of frenzy. The chase was on. Assisted only intermittently by the robot's light, Alex led them always up. They passed a thousand closed doors concealing what? Alex feared that the answer to the Croatian mystery was lost behind one of them. Still they ran on toward whatever sun lit the planet from above. At first, Alex thought, he'd simply become accustomed to the darkness. Then with a start, he realized that light was creeping into the corridors from somewhere up ahead. Yelling, come on! He rallied the others for one final try. Poppy remained in the rear, making swipes at the most aggressive ants. Without warning, they emerged from the corridors into a room more immense than any of the biohabitats had been. Overhead, a great transparent canopy stretched across the real sky. Look! Dana yelled, pointing far across the room. Carberry and Alex followed her gaze and broke into grins. What they saw was a museum exhibit, and what a sweet and beautiful exhibit it was, of unfamiliar design, but unmistakably a spaceship. Poppy caught up just as ant creatures poured out of the passageway. It was going to be close, but Alex felt a weight lifted from his shoulders. For the first time in hours, he thought that they had a fighting chance. Dana reached the spaceship first and spent several precious moments trying to figure out the port controls. Carberry wheezed up and said in his most maddening and befuddled tone, No, my dear, not like that. This, like this. So saying, he manipulated some gadgets and levers, and the airlock swung open. Dana grabbed the old man by the ears and kissed him solidly on the lips. I love you, Prof. She gurgled and pushed him ahead of her into the ship's unlit interior. Trailing behind, Alex and Poppy leapt inside and closed the hatch just in time. The sound of the ants clamoring up the ship's sides was clearly audible. Inside, Poppy and the professor succeeded in getting the lights on, while Alex looked over the ship's controls. Through the ship's portals, Dana watched the ants seethe to and fro on the planet floor before, below. There were thousands of them now, and more were issuing from the empty portals that ringed the room. We'll never get a chance to make a break for it she realized. What about food, water? Worried, she took her fears to Alex. We'll just have to raise the ship and hope for the best, he said. But what about the data we need from the planetary memory book? Uh, there's no help for that. Uh, we'll have to move this thing. Maybe we can put down somewhere else on the planet and try again. Not a bit reassured, Dana was turning back to the port when the deck beneath them gave a mighty heave. She lost her balance and creamed around the room. Alex was shouting, and from deep in the ship, Carberry and Poppy could be heard cursing each other in the engine room. Regaining her balance, Dana worked her way over to the port. Outside, she could see the ants clamoring over each other to rock the ship in a concerted effort. Another few heaves, and I think they'll have us on our side. Alex, can you fly this thing? I'm about to try. Get Carberry and, and the bot out of the control room and strap down. And get up here next to me. I'm going to need a co-pilot. The ship was swaying wildly now. When the whole company was squared away, Alex fingered the alien switches and instructed Dana to warn him if some several light indicators showed yellow. Hand poised over a knob, waiting for the lull in the rocking motion. Alex looked absorbed, yet calm. He looked happy, Dana mused, as the engines caught with a roar and the ship lifted off. Beneath them, the echoing space enclosed became an inferno, a furnace filled with thousands of ant creatures. With a mighty shock, the small craft broke through the canopy 
and pierce the atmosphere. Below, glittering in the sunlight, the library planet diminished. A round metallic ball, an artificial world. Ahead, Alex wondered and despaired. That's the end of chapter 7.